Hello everybody, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, um, part 11, I think, of the uh, Catastrophist series I'm doing. I am so stoked to do this video because it's one of my favorite topics, archaeology. This was my first love. Uh, I've pursued history for other reasons and not archaeology. Here we're talking about the material evidence for the end of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, so the transition view, late antiquity, currently has the upper hand. When examining interpretations here, we have to deal with the two primary forms of evidence we have for the past. We have textual evidence, um, and we have material evidence. So texts, if you want to be really purist, are the domain of history. And material is the domain of archaeology. So history is its own discipline. In America, where I live, archaeology technically is part of anthropology. In Europe, it's a little bit different. Um, but the difference between these two things is that the texts, as a rule, tend to have a biased elite perspective for most of the human record. Not all of it, but for most of it. Uh, the material stuff tends to have a broader perspective. Each one grants its own benefits, and it comes with its own issues. In an ideal world, you have to use both. There are some, especially in the 80s, uh, there were some archaeologists who were a little rabid about this and who insisted that material evidence was the only evidence because you can BS a document. We know that's not true. Um, to be objective, you got to use both. So, the transition view, the, con you know, the, you know, continuity of Christianity, aristocratic culture, that stuff, is apparent in the texts. Uh, but this ignores, or, or at least doesn't fully take into account, the growing material evidence. Um, so why has there been a growth in recent decades of material evidence? So in 1971, Peter Brown writes the world of late antiquity, and he kind of creates this whole field, late antique studies. It spurs an interest in the late Roman Empire, and it attracts a lot of archaeologists. So between about 1980, roughly and 2020, so about 40 years, uh, there's been significant archaeological work on this period, and it's changed our perspective on this thing drastically. So what does that material evidence and what do those dig sites look like? So before we get started with that, uh, I should probably say something about archaeology and how it's conducted. So the archaeological aspect of this is one that is basically always changing as more sites are excavated and more fully excavated. So, when you are excavating a site, um, in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, when archaeology was really coming into its own as a discipline, um, there were dozens and dozens of sites excavated in each digging season by a team every year. Um, now, when you excavate a site, you have to compile field reports. So when you are digging down through the earth, you have to map and mark out, well, in this area, this quadrant of the, of the site, I found these artifacts. Beneath that, I found these artifacts. They relate to this time period, blah, 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 and they get compiled into field reports. The sites have stacks and stacks and stacks of field reports and some of them are kind of sloppy in methodology because they were done so uh, hastily. In modern times, now that the science has improved, we have several digging seasons spent on one portion of one site, so the info is better, but it comes more slowly. Um, as a result, our understanding of the Roman economy is ever-changing. It's getting more complex, but it's doing so a little bit more slowly. Um, so the old view was that the Roman economy was predominantly for the elite, for the military. Not necessarily an incorrect view, considering the amount that Rome spent on the army, uh, but the, the old view is everyone else was poor and miserable. The new view is that an elite tier existed, yeah, the military was prime too. Um, the poor were still poor and to a degree miserable, but we have evidence for mass production and mass distribution as well. So central to our understanding of the Roman economy, and I mean not necessarily ancient Rome, a lot of ancient societies in general 
And what came next is something that is rather boring, um, pottery. So pottery is the archaeologist's blessing. They love this stuff, so do I. Um, it's also their nightmare because there's so much of it. If you are interested in antiquities, you will find oftentimes that there are serious ethical problems with saying, oh, I want to collect, you know, because I have F you money, I'm, I'm a millionaire, I want to collect, uh, I don't know, some high-end object. Uh, Norse swords, ancient weaponry, etc. There are ways you can get around this depending on how common it is, but there are ethical problems with trying to get that stuff. Oftentimes, a lot of it comes through, like, the black market, and grave robbing, etc. Um, pottery is something you, generally speaking, can actually collect, especially from the Roman Empire. Because there's so much of it, like, this is basically garbage. I mean, you have... I mean, it's, it's, it's pottery. It's fired clay. Uh, this thing breaks, unless you're into the Japanese thing where you glue it back together and make it pretty... You just throw it out, so a lot of pottery heaps we have are just like trash pits. So there's so much of it that it's excavated, it's cataloged, um, storage runs out, and it's just dumped, or it's sold. There's just no room for it. Um, now, Roman pottery, generally speaking, has three characteristics. It is of high quality, and that quality appears to have been pretty well standardized. There is mass production of pottery. And we have a broad geographic uh, and economic area of distribution of that pottery. This is not to be seen again in, in Europe, in the Mediterranean. In Ward Perkins' estimates, uh, for about 800 years, until about 1400, 1500. Now, the pottery that we have for the Roman Empire is usually glossed, so it's waterproof. It's smooth, it's hard, and it's uniform in consistency. Many examples, if you handle it, appear almost modern in their feel and durability. They almost feel and look like modern ceramics. As far as the material evidence is concerned, we have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, um, of shards. So, my point is we have a crap load of pottery data, uh, which have been excavated over the past two centuries. Now, archaeologists have built entire careers around excavating and cataloging that pottery. Um, so... Excavating, washing, cleaning, and then cataloging now take up a major portion of the digging season. So what you do is you gradually catalog this stuff, and there are some archaeologists who are able to look at a piece, a tiny, tiny piece of a shard, and tell you where it was made, when, and how it was possible to get that shard to wherever it is in the Roman Empire you're looking. Um, of course, there are problems here. You know, in an ideal world, we would like to know what actual production percentages would look like. We don't have the accounting data and the economic data. We don't have the numbers, basically, to tell us this. Uh, but there is one site, there is one archaeological dig site, which can give us an idea for a sheer scale of the production of the Roman Empire. And, you know... It should not surprise us, perhaps, that pottery being pottery, that site is a trash heap. It's not an exaggeration to say that most archaeological sites dealing with pottery are probably garbage pits. Stuff breaks, you gotta put it somewhere. Um, so, I don't speak Italian, I'm not gonna butcher this, um, but this big mound you see in the bottom right-hand corner is, uh, you know, Mount Pottery. <laughs> That's a decent translation from Italian to English. Um, I want you to keep in mind that it's a big hill, and the stuff around it are modern-day houses and buildings. So you get an idea of how big this thing is. It's 20,000 square meters, 580,000 cubic meters uh, in volume. It's a kilometer in circumference and 35 meters high. This thing is giant. Probably, it's been estimated there's something like, you know, based on the amount of shards we have, if you were to reconstruct every one, something like 53 million uh, amphorae. So... These are the jugs, the, the, the pottery jugs, the vessels in which you store um, olive oil or wine, etc. for transport. And it's estimated that there's about, in terms of volume, 6 million liters of olive oil that are able to be held in this pit if you were to reconstruct everything. So this is a massive amount 
of pottery, which means it had to be made. It can hold about 6 million liters, which means that stuff had to come from somewhere, so it says it, so it suggests the Roman economy was extraordinarily complex for the ancient world. Roman pottery, you know, this tells us was thus produced in high quantities, and it was shipped all over the empire and beyond. For example, you know, we have pottery in Ireland, the Isle of Man, Denmark. As a rule, this pottery uh, was pretty high quality. Now, the elite, of course, had a superior form of pottery, as elites always do. They have the money. But, good pottery. It has glaze, so it's waterproof. Maybe there's a slip on it. It's stylized, etc. Um, things we would typically associate with, like, elite stuff is found in archaeological contexts of Roman farms and small villages. Very humble areas, so it suggests very, very strongly even poor people could obtain access to good quality materials. In the early medieval period, the evidence suggests that this sophistication broke down quickly. Um, I don't know about hard numbers, but archaeological field reports, you know, if you're on an archaeological site or you see photographs, you can't help but be struck by, like, barrels and barrels and barrels of Roman stuff. Roman, to the point where it's basically just Roman garbage. And then a couple boxes from the early medieval period. So we know the scale broke down. Um, why this was the case is the subject of the rest of Ward Perkins' book, and it will be the subject of the remaining videos. He has a couple ideas here. Um, I have a couple ideas myself, and we'll get into this as the videos progress. But until then, you know, this has been a brief introduction, a brief overview of, you know, Roman pottery and some of the archaeology. And I kind of just wanted to give you an impression of the sheer scale of the Roman economy. Remember, in Rome, in Italy, there's that amount of 53 million vessels. They produce stuff on a huge scale. So we're going to keep going with this in future videos, and until then, I will see you all next time.